After all, the history of the archdiocese goes back to 1850, the diocese to 1880, and there's been a recognizable Catholic community in this city since the 1780s. So it's too vast a topic, I'd say, for one evening. Also, I'm reminded of a story I heard recently about an after-dinner speaker in Ireland who didn't know when to stop. And he went on and on and on and drove the people there to distraction. Or, since this was Ireland, he drove them to drink, literally. <laughs> they drained every bottle of wine on the tables. And finally, one person could stand it no longer. He got up, took an empty wine bottle, went up to the dais, and he stood behind the speaker. And he went to take a swing at him. But unfortunately, the man was so inebriated, he missed the speaker. He hit the person sitting next to the speaker. And as that poor fellow was falling to the ground, he was heard to say, hit me again, I can still hear him. <laughs> so, I see there is some wine at the rear of the hall, and I wouldn't want to provoke an incident like that, especially since the bishop and Walter Higgins are both good friends of mine. So it's really the, the history of the archdiocese is just too big a topic. What I would like to do, however, is this. What I would like to do is zero in on one person who certainly was a remarkable figure in the history of this archdiocese, namely the first archbishop, John Hughes. He, was, he ruled the roost here for 25 years, and both then and now he's been a very controversial figure. But if you look at what the state of the diocese was when he came here, what he accomplished during those 25 years and the legacy that he left, I don't think it's any exaggeration to speak of him as the most important of the 11 bishops and archbishops of New York. In fact, some years ago, Cardinal O'Connor had a dinner party in his residence for Monsignor Cohelan the distinguished historian of the archdiocese. And Cardinal O'Connor liked to needle people, even when he was the host. And he said to Monsignor Cohelan, Monsignor, do you agree with John Tracy Ellis, the great church historian, that John Hughes was the greatest archbishop of New York? Monsignor Cohelan said, yes, I do agree with that. And then Cardinal O'Connor said, do you further agree with Monsignor Ellis? that John Hughes will always be the greatest Archbishop of New York. Cohelan was very quick, and he said, Your Eminence, about things like that, I think we should confine ourselves to the deceased. <laughs> but I don't think there's any doubt that John Hughes was, and probably always will be, the outstanding figure in the history of the Archdiocese. Let me say something, first of all, about him as a person, and then the contribution that he made to this archdiocese. First of all, he was born in 1797 in County Tyrone. And he said that for the first five days of his life, he was on the same plane as the most favored subject of the British Empire. The first five days of his life. What he meant was between the day he was born and the day he was baptized. Once he was baptized a Catholic, he automatically became a second-class citizen in 18th century Ireland, and he knew that. He came to this country in 1817, the age of 20. He had no money, uh, very little education, very few prospects for getting a job. He wound up spending three years working construction jobs, most of the time repairing roads. So he had in many, many ways, he shared the lot of the common Irish immigrant of that period. And later on as the archbishop, that was a great source of strength. He could identify with his people more than almost any other archbishop could because he had personal experience of what they had gone through. He knew what it was to be the victim of prejudice and also poverty. It was a great source of strength to him in being a leader for his people. I should mention John Hughes was ordained a priest in Philadelphia, 1826. And he came here 12 years later, not as the bishop, 
but as the coadjutor or assistant bishop to the old and failing Bishop John Dubois. I should mention Bishop, he was 74, from your perspective, a mere youth. But anyway, Bishop Dubois, as he was failing, he needed help, and John Hughes was sent here to be his coadjutor. Ordinarily, a coadjutor has no real authority at all. He just waits in the wings until the bishop shuffles off to eternity. However, a few months after John Hughes came here, old Bishop Dubois suffered a series of strokes, and Hughes was made the administrator of the diocese. That was 1839. 1842, he automatically succeeded Bishop Dubois as the fourth bishop. And then in 1850, he became the first archbishop. He died on January 3rd, 1864. So it's really 25 years that he was governing, directing the church in New York. And shortly after he took over the reins, he looked around the state of the diocese and he wrote a letter to his good friend, the Bishop of Cincinnati, and he said to him, I think I've been sent here in punishment for my sins. <laughs> That's how bad the situation was. The diocese had existed for 31 years, but it really was largely a, a chaotic affair. There had been three bishops before John Hughes came here. The first never even got here, Richard Concanon. He was an Irish Dominican friar living in Rome and in 1808, he was appointed the first bishop of New York. Closest he ever got was Naples, trying to get a ship to take him across the Atlantic. John O'Connor used to like to say he was the smartest of the bishops of New York, <laughs> because he never came here. The second bishop was another Irish Dominican friar, John Connolly, who had spent 40 years in Rome in a desk job. And then at the age of 68, he was made the second bishop of New York. It was an awfully unfair appointment to him and to the diocese. In fact, old Archbishop Carroll was furious when he heard this, because he said neither he nor anybody in this country had been consulted about that appointment. But John Connolly came here at the age of 68 and lasted 10 years. And I should point out the diocese that he came to govern was the whole state of New York and half of New Jersey, 55,000 square miles. He had three churches, two in New York City, one in Albany. The next Catholic church was in Detroit. He had five priests, most of whom soon left. The great church historian Peter Gilday said one time, he said, it's hard to think of any bishop in the history of this country who started off under more difficult circumstances than poor Bishop Conley. He came here in 1815, 1817, work began on the Erie Canal which meant a great influx of Irish immigrants. And he simply was overwhelmed by the magnitude of the, the task. He died in 1825, and after a long vacancy, the third bishop was appointed, John Dubois. Dubois had plenty of experience in America. He was a native of Paris, came here in 1791. So he'd been in America as a missionary and as an educator for 35 years. He was a very devout, earnest man. He had one enormous handicap, which wasn't his fault, but there was no way he could overcome it. That was the fact he was French. And almost every Catholic in New York at the time was Irish. And they resented him enormously and gave him a very, very hard time. Poor Dubois tried to mollify the Irish. He put a shamrock in his coat of arms. That didn't do any good. His first pastoral letter, he pointed out that St. Patrick wasn't born in Ireland either. <laughs> and, and suggested that, like himself, he was a native of France. So that didn't cut much mustard. Uh, so poor Dubois had an awfully difficult time simply because he wasn't Irish. He said one time to the, some of his parishioners, your real objection is not that I'm not American. Your real objection is that I'm not Irish. And that was true. And it was awfully unfair on the part of the New York Irish. Uh, he had an awful lot of trouble, too, with the lay trustees of his own cathedral. At one time, they threatened to cut off his own salary. And he said to them, gentlemen, he said, I'm an old man. I survived the French Revolution. 
And he said, I can live in a cellar, I can live in a garret. But whether I come up from the cellar or down from the garret, I'll still be your bishop.